Miguel, Miguel for kind introduction and um, right now to invite um, Aman Kumar from Republic of Estonia as the CIO and also the advisor to the government. Uh, we uh, have Han, I think everybody knows uh, Han from Autonomous and um, we know from Dan Kepler we have uh, Janish Patel. So these are the panelists today, and I'm sure you agree with me that Vitaly has done an excellent job. So why don't we give him a lot, another round of applause? <laughs> he has, um, has actually given us a lot of new concepts and ideas yesterday and today, especially today. And I'm sure you have a lot of questions. So I'm not going to um, ask the panel a lot of questions. I'm going to just ask them one question, and then I pass mic to the floor and I think uh, Vitalik has, has uh, talked a lot about the limitation of uh, blockchain uh, which is very interesting because a lot of people who are looking at blockchain will always look at how what blockchain can do and uh, it seems that it can do everything in the world, it can solve all the problems that we have. Uh, Vitalik in the last few days has discussed a lot about the limitation scalability problem about blockchain size, storage issue, privacy issues that he talked about, security issues that he talked about, he talked about latency issue, and he had just mentioned some of the solution. And it's quite clear they're solving some of those problems. So my question to the panel, we have farm managers here, we have the representation as advisors to the government, we have somebody who's on the startup who's dealing with uh, a lot of blockchain application. Uh, my question to the panel here, just one for tonight, is that if you are an investor, and you are a government, of course the government will never choose, uh, try to pick a winner, but you, you have to choose a winner for a smart nation. In what area of the project you think that will have the greatest impact uh, using blockchain, using smart contract that you think either as an investor you get the highest return, as a government you see the biggest impact, and as a creator of startups, you will see the best value. So maybe I start with Janish. I'm sure I don't understand the question. <laughs> <laughs> so am I choosing countries, companies? A any application for a smart nation. What application, the use case that you can think of that we want to invest in next few years the most fabulous investment. So um, we already have invested um, and the first company we invested is in Ahn's company. Um, and the simple reason was it was solving a problem for us as VCs uh, and the asset management industry in, in general. The big issue we face is fund formation, escrow problems, collateralization issues, uh, and just basic requirements as a VC to understand what companies we look at have in their cap structures, their corporate governance, how they're formed. So for us, the very basic use application that Han put together was profound enough for us to make the investment. We weren't the only ones. Uh, Fimbushi here uh, has, that, that's attending as well, and the Talek side were also investors. <coughs> but for us, application and use cases are the most important reason for investing. And we felt that Han's company was uh, representing something that we wanted to see, at least in Singapore. I actually tend to coincide. <laughs> Good one to you, Han. Because, uh, but if I can maybe take the the next uh, turn here, um, I think what Janesh is saying is is uh, valid as a as a VC. But let's think about it a little bit more philosophical, right? Let's play that mind game where we think about God's perfect country. What would God do in a perfect country? He would surely he would put uh, shares on blockchain, right? And why would he put shares on blockchain? Because if you put shares on blockchain, what you're actually doing is you let everybody who wish something to see happen, right? Um, Elon Musk, he defines success as doing stuff that people really want to succeed, right? So if we all think about stuff we want to see happen, maybe we want to go and uh, establish an outpost on Mars, and we firmly believe we need to leave planet Earth, and things like that, things that we all feel should happen, then you want to make investing, putting funds, your savings behind something as easily accessible as possible. And, and currently, this process is still 
quite heavily intermediated. And that is not to say that we will disintermediate the way Ginesh and the VCs, but there will be mechanisms, and I think the DAO may be a first indication of that, where we all are able to very easily invest in projects, companies, um, um, things that we believe should happen, and that way we all feel good about uh, being part of this. Blockchain is going to be that operating system, not in the MS-DOS sense, as Vitalik showed us, but that operating system for a whole new economic paradigm. And it's going to be a sort of the post-capitalist paradigm that we haven't quite defined yet. We don't really have a label for it yet, but it will be very much decentralized. It will be very much bottomed up. It will be journalism that is written by all of us. It will be music that's composed by all of us. It will be projects and companies that have been started by all of us. And I think that's where blockchain will really play the most crucial role. Yes, and that, that is very interesting. Because um, things that we can't really move, like land, titan, and so on, or with blockchain will be very interesting. Because always would be there. You could actually use blockchain to make a register for land, titan. And look at companies, the, the entity will still be around. And it's interesting as long as um, it's a live company. And then we look at people that actually can move around quite a little bit and across the world and so on. That comes to our mind. What, what do you think about e-residents and e industry? Well, why don't we let this guy go go first because I really want to know his answer to what he thinks <laughs> the best Ethereum application could be. First of all, it's a if God actually if God actually existed, he wouldn't put the shares on a blockchain. He put the shares on a on a server, and he would run the server himself. <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, yeah, God, God. Unfortunately, God doesn't exist. <laughs> and uh, so we're stuck with a set of uh, imperfect humans who have to create imperfect institutions where imperfect humans are running the institutions themselves, and. Uh, Decentralization seems to be one of those nice possible, uh, possible sort of partial solutions. I think, um, in general, uh, first of all, I agree with the consensus opinion that autonomous is good. <laughs> um, second, I think uh, the most interesting sort of benefits from blockchain technology often even come not just from one single application, but from the ability of different applications to work together and state to form a kind of open standard. So you know, one thing I mentioned uh, sort of very briefly in my presentation is this uh, application that a uh, developer, uh, Thomas Bertani, made that we kind of verifies Estonian e-residency certificates inside of Ethereum. <coughs> Excellent. By, its, you know, by itself, that's, you know, okay, okay, fine, you have yet another identity system, and now it uses a, uses a blockchain for some reason. Where it gets interesting is when you have the ability to combine that together with smart contracts together with sort of applications inside of autonomous to, you know, such you know things like you know even like some something like let's say crowdfunding where you want to limit each participant to one thousand dollars if you want to do that you need an identity system guess what if you use blockchains and if you use open standards the identity system already exists you can just plug into it you don't even need to talk to the company that's building it so I think you know another example is let's say if you want your blockchain-based company to hold some kind of physical assets, then well, guess what? Digix over in Singapore as well is putting digital is creating a kind of token on the blockchain that's backed by gold, and they're going to expand to other kinds of assets. So, the real benefits come, I think, not even as, like sure you can increase kind of levels of levels of trust in each individual application separately, but it's also important to keep in mind the kind of in, massively increased ease of kind of just putting these applications together and creating sort of Lego stru structures where the sort of glue between the bricks is essentially cryptographically strong. And I think that, you know, there's just a lot of potential from that. Well, it's a little bit uh, tough to follow that one, but I will do my best. My Name's Aman. It does take me a little bit longer to talk. So, quick show of hands. Who of you in this room has seen the movie The King's Speech? Okay, for those of you who are not raising your hands, look at the guys raising their hands and ask them and, and ask them about it. 
later. <laughs> my day job is is with SAP. I'm in the office of the CEO. But just over the last year or so, I've been increasingly roped in to the the Estonian infrastructure and the Estonian government systems, uh, partially by by deep uh, deep deep personal interest, and that is that uh, that as a United States citizen, my interactions with government were always a little bit dicey. Uh, whether it's trying to get a driver's license and having them think your F, your 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 epileptic to to probably e e even today trying to come in to the country as a single brown man uh, with with a stammer. Uh, when I, I wasn't exposed to Estonia until last year, and then when I went there and spent some time there, uh, they have essentially made an entire government stack of services from healthcare to schooling to voting to tax that is all accessible digitally. The purpose of this panel was to talk about smart city, smart contracts, and smart nations you find out very quickly that when you put things into software, you allow inclusion and access to a whole range of people. No Estonian will have some of the challenges that I had as a United States citizen, simply by what they were able to make into software. And the first slide or well, maybe the second of Vitaly's deck really resonated. Because the more you can inject <coughs> security into a society, the more you empower people, the, 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 the more fringe people you can start including, uh, and you, you ultimately create a more res resilient, healthy, Country. And so I hope that if God uh, made a perfect country, he would at least look at the, at the Estonian model and hopefully the Singaporean model as well. Uh, to me, in partial answer, sorry that was a long-winded uh, introduction, but in partial answer to Professor Lee's question, I would have to say that if you can get the identity layer right, if people can if you can trust that someone is who they say they are, no matter how they look or how they talk, uh, and then build up a set of services around that, um, fundamentally, the more secure you make the lower layers, the, the more you can empower people at, at successively more interesting applications. Um, and it, frankly, what it comes down to is not necessarily Sorry, Vitaly, not necessarily about the technology, but about the culture and the processes and, and the sort of mindsets behind it. So Estonia has some remarkable advances in that that maybe we'll have the chance to talk about. I was hoping slides 55 through 60 were making that point already, but. <laughs> so. so yeah, interesting. So it's going to be identification of land, identification of Correct. company, identification of people. Those are very interesting. I'm not going to make any controversial statement like uh, accountants will all be out of job. I promise you not to do that. But actually, accounting, uh, internal audit, processes, and so on will be very interesting. But I promise not to ask any more questions because I have so many questions for Italy, even though I, we have been uh, talking to each other for quite some time. I'll reserve those questions. And I want to open the questions to the floor because I know you have a lot of questions to ask. So can I have the first question from the floor? Tell us where you're from, which country, which um, company you're from, and your name. Thank you. Please. Hi, I'm Ju from uh, uh, Spark Systems, which is part of uh, Diamond's VC. Uh, now, uh, this is the perfect panel to, to sort of bring this question. Um, 
the main attractiveness or one of the main attractiveness of blockchains is that it's secure. Right? So uh, my question is actually very basic. How secure is it? Is it hackable? And uh, to what extent is, should this be a concern? Is this a marginal concern? Or is this something that can, because you're, you're basing identities off it, you're building layers on top of it. So how, how dependable is the security? Okay. So in general, there's two ways that you can hack something to do with the blockchain. One of them is to break the blockchain. The other way is to break the security system that the individual person uses to talk to the blockchain. And that would include you know, hacking into computers, private keys, and so forth. That's something I would um, argue that so far, that's been the source of pretty much 100, almost 100% of, at least 99% of the problems. So it's, it definitely is a kind of very practical sort of user interface security issue. I know there are lots of you know people dealing with it. Although, actually, a few days ago, people asked me about sort of blockchain blind spots. I would even argue that sort of focusing on that particular angle is one of them, and something I'd like to see more companies doing. Regarding the blockchain protocols themselves, I would say, yeah. I mean, first of all. It's uh, number one. It is the case that you know no that you know no there is kind of no single entity that's kind of a, a single point of failure where if they decide to sort of you know either disappear or try to attack the network that the system is going to break. But at the same time, as we've seen practically speaking, a lot of these systems do tend to kind of fairly heavily depend on a kind of moderately concentrated uh, set of infrastructure, miners, mining pools. Um, even kind of routing routing protocols, so it's uh, it's not quite at this sort of level of a sort of ideal utopian system where you have a million computers and you actually literally needs to break into five hundred thousand and one of them in order to break the system. But it's kind of somewhere in the middle. Hi, I'm, I'm Marcelo from DX Markets. Um, uh, thanks for your, uh, your presentation, I really enjoyed it. And I do agree with most of the statements you make. And I have a question about scalability. You mentioned that uh, banks and governments generally are concerned <coughs> about scalability of blockchain technology. And you also referred to Ethereum as the, the world computer. And I do agree with, it, with that statement. And uh, my question to you uh, is, Considering that the security of the network and the, the, the trust in the smart contracts relies on the fact that every node has to run the smart contract with the same set of inputs to validate that the result is, is the same, no one's tampering with the logic. Uh, that essentially means to me that the uh, amount of processing power they have in the entire internet, in the entire cluster of uh, computers running the smart contracts is as fast as a single computer. Yes. So uh, that is uh, a huge uh, paradox to me. So I'd like to, to hear your thoughts how uh, the platform is going to evolve and change to, mm -hmm. to tackle that fundamental So problem. first of all, in the very short term, it's not as fast as one computer, it's as fast as 0 0.05 computers. So what a lot of people don't realize is that especially in kind of public blockchains, there are sort of economic centralization constraints and other issues that basically mean that it's not very safe to have a blockchain where every node has to run even more than like five or ten percent of the time. So it's uh, like there is a bunch of sort of academic papers uh, papers on it. It'll take a while to kind of explain the math, and it'll take less time if I had a whiteboard and I don't, so I'll skip it. But uh, there are short-term fixes that can re that can mitigate that, and that can let you go up from you know running a computer five percent of the time to like running half the time. But that only gets you to 10x. If you want to do 1,000x, then you want to do so, uh, something that's sort of substantially more radical. So our longer term strategy is the S approach that we call sharding, which is that basically, instead of every computer verifying every transaction, you kind of put transactions into groups, and then you kind of randomly select nodes and assign each, uh, each transaction group to one particular set of nodes, and you can process many groups in parallel. So the throughput of the system could potentially sort of go up with uh, the more uh, computers, computers that get added to the network. So that's an approach that we're currently kind of very actively looking into, but of course it will take some time before we actually push out a live network that has those kinds of properties. Yes. Hi, uh, 
Uh, Matthew Bloom from Thomson Reuters here. Uh, let's just make an assumption that in the next five years, somebody creates a viable quantum computer, and you can instantly factor large prime numbers, effectively getting rid of the current uh, RSA security, like uh, yes. What effects do you think this would have on blockchain? blockchain? Okay, so two main effects. The first, so in general, quantum computers have two major classes of algorithms that cryptographers don't like. One of them is called Shor's algorithm. That can completely break many large classes of mainstream cryptography, including RSA, ECC, anything based off of any kind of finite cyclic group. Second algorithm is an algorithm called Grover's algorithm, which is much more universal. It works on any function, but the speed up it offers is only a square root. So if before it would take like a trillion trillion steps to break an algorithm, it goes down to taking a trillion steps. So Grover, in the case of, of blockchains use cryptography in two places. One of them is for account security, and the other one is proof of work based blockchains use, use hashes for mining. Now, if one, some entity creates a quantum computer, then a quantum computer will be able to use Grover's algorithm and it'll be able to mine much faster than everyone else, because instead of taking to the power of 70 steps to create a block, it'll take only to the power of 35 steps. So, for that reason, as soon as a quantum computer gets created, there's quite a large chance that all proof of work blockchains will pretty much entirely be at the mercy of the particular user that creates a quantum computer first. That's one of the secondary reasons why we're interested in proof of stake, where you don't kind of rely on mining for security. Second point, account security. Account security, okay, sure, this algorithm means you can break a bunch of cryptography algorithms. There are still some algorithms that are resistant to quantum computing. These algorithms are, how they are vulnerable to Grover's algorithm, but you can fix that pretty easily by basically just increasing the key lines to compensate for the <coughs> And so, you should be able to just sort of switch from one algorithm to the other blockchains or keep working fine. One of the features we're actually planning in a, in a future release of Ethereum is we're actually planning on kind of abstracting out the cryptography so that the cryptography isn't a part of the protocol, it's actually a part of a smart contract code. And once that happens, basically individual accounts will be able to make themselves quantum proof on their own schedule. So basically, so uh, uh, the sort of main conclusion is Yes, quantum computers will be annoying, but at the same time, there's good news. And at the same time, quantum computers will make up for it by making a bunch of nice algorithms like AI much, much faster and hopefully improve the progress of that field by like a decade or so. Now, this this uh, very, much, very much, I think, matches the Estonian philosophy as well. Um, they have something called e-residency where they take all of their their identity and government infrastructure, make it available to foreigners to apply for. So anyone in this room can go to an Estonian consulate, give their passport, uh, to pass, pass an interview and background check, and then get an Estonian digital identity card from which they can then log into the Estonian system. I'm leaving my card from Shanghai in two weeks. Nice. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> um, and and the benefits are enormous. You can incorporate an Estonian company remotely. You can you know do company administration remotely. Um, let's say you're an entrepreneur in one country that PayPal will do business with your banks. You can then incorporate in Estonia to PayPal to get PayPal to do business with Estonian banks, so on. Um, and the question we get all the time is is around the RSA stuff and the certificate imp implementation, to which we we say there are many more problems to think about than the what is essentially an implementation detail of the cryptography. The point is more to to get people to to use these systems to get cultures and institutions aligned around their benefits. Uh, we have to believe, we have to trust, I think in our own, um, in ourselves, that as technological breakthroughs happen, we'll be able to keep evolving these systems independently of the culture and the processes. Um, and in fact, you can look at the, at the history of technology. This has happened over and over and over again, uh, both in, in in hardware and software, things that people thought would, would, would completely remove a use case or make a certain use case unviable, market forces generally uh, save the day. 
Yeah, just actually, I have a question for Janesh and Han. Is that I think from the overview discussion earlier, Ahmad uh, Zovitelik, is that we, the, the most difficult thing about what we are trying to do <coughs> is about the virtual world versus the real world, which I've been talking about for quite some time. That we have in the virtual world um, for the government, we have um, the Justice Department, we have the courts, we have the lawyers working. And now we're talking about smart contract in the virtual world that you don't really have a virtual court. Uh, the, the, the mindset will then be very different from the regulatory, uh, um, regula from, even from the, the way the regulator will start thinking about issues. How do you have situation where you are across or asset classes where you provide the services that will cross all jurisdiction and you have uh, issues of your serving different nationality with identity. We are, we are no, no more talking about the physical world, we are no more talking about uh, you know the hinterland that we are talking about, we are talking about serving people with identity, uh, digital identity on, on the net. It is something like a hinternet rather than a hinterland. So, from your investment perspective and from your experience uh, and from the autonomous, how do you feel like? It? How do you feel about this? What is your what's your opinion? maybe David, maybe a general point that it's always difficult to imagine innovation. Uh, for instance, at the time of Mozart, when people were listening to music, you had to bring in the whole chamber orchestra, or right. Uh, players and then now we all have it sit on our on our phone as digital packages nobody could have possibly imagined that that would be the way we would ever have listened to music and replicate music I think it, it may be a little bit the same with um, uh, with blockchain and and how we're going to digitize assets generally uh, it's now still a little bit the phase where oh the first black man is a president of the United States it's a novelty it's a new thing and soon it may be a woman. I should probably say, hopefully, will be a woman being the next president of the United States. And, and that again is going to be a, a novelty. But I, I think, uh, I'm, you know, you're happy to take me up on this one. That in five years, blockchain is going to be inserted in a lot of processes, and we won't even realize. Um, I don't know what happens to you when you drive a car, but I don't lift up the bonnet. I don't understand what's going on underneath the bonnet. I just want the car to take me from A to B. And so every fintech conference I, I attend, and I swear I don't attend all of them, it's blockchain, blockchain, blockchain is sort of the big novel thing. And let's, let's have that calm down a little bit. Let's hopefully see more real businesses being built on it. And then it's going to become quite evident that blockchain, in certain use cases, either permissioned or fully decentralized, is actually a, a cheaper, a more efficient, a faster technology. And we're going to get used to that, just like we are now used to listen to Mozart on our on our iPhone. So, Janesh, so you as an investor, you have to get return. So we always talk about blockchain. A lot of people think that blockchain is uh, is a solution for looking for problems. But uh, can we really make money investing in blockchain? I think it actually goes back to what Han and Vitalik have already said. It's about how you use technology to deliver services or applications or use cases. Um, I have a 10-year fund life, so I have to make a return on investments. It's pretty black and white for what I have to do in my day job. So I'm not in a position to take a technological view, whether it's on quantum computing, because I sit on the board of a quantum computing company, or whether it's on blockchain. But what the quantum computing company does that I sit on the board of is they try to find software applications with where the architecture sits today and delivers that to banks, non-financials. You know, it's the use cases that matter to companies like us, funds like us. Um, and actually, interestingly enough, uh, happens to be the case pretty much across the corporate world right now. Everyone's trying to find solutions that can apply, whether it's blockchain technology, whether it's quantum computing, or whether it's any other sort of new and emerging technology that's coming out in any sector. So it falls back down to this issue of use case. Let's look at the future returns and the future. Let's back to the floor. you have any question out there? Hi, um, I'm Simon from Singapore Management University. 
I was just having a question around um, the role of oracles that are that are going to play on uh, on a variety of blockchains, and to what extent oracles risk becoming new single points of failure. Yeah, I mean, oracles are definitely going to be very important. You need data if you want to have smart contracts and do interesting things based off of data. If you don't want them, that said, if you don't want them to become single points of, fa of failure, there are definitely ways where you can kind of at least partially decentralize the, the, your dependence on oracles as well. Like, you, you don't have to rely on one. You could take, like, the median of five of them. There's, uh, I think, lots of uh, different approaches. So I'm not kind of, I'm not really too worried about that. Although uh, it definitely is, I definitely do want to kind of. Well, I think one thing that the community can do to ensure that it becomes practical to do things like you know just vote between five oracles instead of relying on one is to try to promote standardization efforts. So and to promote the existence of an ecosystem where we actually have lots of oracles, so that the more we have, the more the less we need to rely on a specific one. Very back. It's a very back day. Hi, I'm Goran. I'm from Atoros, a blockchain startup. Uh, my question is, how do you see different blockchains coexisting together? Do you think that applications would cluster towards uh, some blockchains according to use cases, or would applications use different blockchains uh, together? I think it's... Uh, I mean, first of all, I think we've already seen some consolidation. We've seen, uh, I think, most of, like blockchains that don't have that don't provide any kind of sort of unique value toward at least some set of use cases. They continue to exist because that's what blockchains do, but they're not really sort of getting anywhere and you can't really bootstrap a new blockchain at this point in time unless you actually are providing a lot of value. So the number of them has gone down pretty substantially. But at the same time, you know, there it definitely doesn't need to be kind of one blockchain to rule them all. And there are ways to create applications that even sit up multiple contracts. There are ways to make a blockchain set of talk to each other. There are ways to literally create kind of high-level smart contract code that compiles down into contract code that sits on top of multiple blockchains plus communication systems between them. So, like I know BTC Relay, which is like a sort of co contract that does that sort of verifies Bitcoin transactions inside of Ethereum. It's been doing some work in that direction already, and I think that's an area that's definitely going to see more progress. I think we should take it a question from practitioners who at this stage may wonder who, you know, how is all this relevant and applicable to what I'm doing as working at a bank or a law firm or a, a, an accountancy firm. And so, by all means, uh, if there's anybody here who wonders. How is this relevant to me? We'd love to hear from you. <coughs> or you can quit and join us on this. <laughs> <laughs> is that a question that? It's not really a question. I think uh, blockchain gives us the opportunity to see uh, performance, right? I mean, Vitalik can correct me on that. We spoke about the gentleman next to David about ROI. I mean, today in our society is about consumer profiling, right? We want to know what people do, what they spend. Is there a way blockchain can be used to see the performance of employees at manager, manager level or marketing level, banker level or like government level? Is there any way the blockchain can be used to see the performance of uh, of what? Of, uh, of everyone in the bank? Of to every the KPI because bank, when you join a big company like IBM, you have KPI in sales, right? Yes. Bank, uh, 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 fund manager has to deliver results as well, right? Yeah. Can blockchain be used to see give visibility to a managing director not based in Singapore but in Paris or London? I mean, one general consequence of kind of wider blockchain adoption in general is that kind of more of the individual operations that all of us make are going to kind of leave a cryptographic trail of ev evidence behind them that people can't point to, and you can actually you know do things <laughs> like an individual can, for example, you know show a history that says that you know nine, like. 15 of the 20, let's say, yeah, investments that they advocated actually did actually did end up uh, did end up succeeding, or they let's say, in in a credit rating context, that they successfully paid their phone bills without interruption for 10 years in a row. So, those kinds of things are definitely going to become easier and lower cost. I mean, that said, they're not going to solve the problem entirely because I think in a lot of cases you just run into the inevitable barrier that sort of verifying performance is subjective. And there's only so there's only so much that sort of more efficient cryptography can do in, in, in mitigating that. 
And what, what, with Halleck said about leaving more cryptographic trails isn't necessarily a bad thing. For example, when <coughs> when Estonia put its e it put its health records and health <coughs> registry online, the first question folks asked were, "How am I? How should I know that this hasn't been hacked? That my information is in fact safe?" And the Estonian e health ledger has, uh, when you log in, the first thing you see is all the doctors, all the nurses who have potentially, who, who have access to your data. And it's your responsibility to make sure that only the doctors you recognize have, have actually looked at your, your record. Now where this gets really interesting is the laws. <coughs> if you see a name on that ledger that you don't recognize, there's a button, and by law, they're required to do an investigation. The doctor has to explain why in that instance they access your record, and the penalties are extremely severe. If they can't, it's pretty much, pretty much automatic forfeiture of their of their license. So they make the, the penalty so severe that no one actually does bad things. And so we, we at least maybe in the US, we hear this, these words like increased cryptographic footprint and we kind of freak out and we think about Big Brother. But the reality is if you're thoughtful about how to implement it, if you educate the people who use it, and you create a culture and a legal system in place that actually takes advantage of this increased transparency, you wind up with a vastly improved system. Uh, just so curiosity, how many people have signed up for the key residents? Uh, so we uh, crossed the 10,000 person mark about a few months ago, which is bad for something that's only been publicly marketed for about nine months. And you have to remember, Estonia is a tiny, tiny country. They're just a million and a half people. So if it, it, the, the, their approach to this is, is if you can get even 1% of E residents to start a company in, in Estonia or to invest in it, you're actually moving the needle on a relative basis. We are running out of time yeah. for maybe about another last question that we can have on the floor. Hi, um, Julia Walker from Thompson Reuters. <coughs> Following on from some of those topics, what's your view on how blockchain can help some of the big banking problems around sort of KYC and onboarding? Yeah, I mean, I think. Uh, in general, sort of identity verification is definitely one of those problems that blockchain te uh, technology can, uh, I think, uh, at least be the platform for solving very well. Like, I think uh, one of the things that, one of the positive consequences that could come out of it is a kind of natural sort of bootstrapping and stand standardization of a kind of essentially sort of digital sort of self sovereign identity. So the model here is basically that Right now, you basically have to KYC yourself with kind of a bunch of different entities separately, and they all end up having to verify the same thing. But what we could, I think, what the world of identity could look like if what, you know what we're doing sort of uh, takes off is that you imagine you have a sort of basic notion of an account. Anyone can create an account. Anyone can create ten million accounts. Accounts are just cryptographic <laughs> on the blockchain. Then you have a set of entities, and these entities can make different kinds of assertions about accounts. So an entity might say, this account corresponds to a unique person who happens to be a citizen of some particular country, and then he might, you know, an assertion might be, this person has some particular phone no unique phone number, an assertion might say, this person has passed a criminal background check, and so you have, and then in, these assertions don't need to be collected on any kind of centralized server. Each individual assertion is just between the asserter and yourself. And of course, you know, it's just a simple cryptographically signed message. 
if you want to authenticate yourself to some party, all you do is you provide the link to you know your blockchain based identity, sign a message as crypto growth that cryptographic key that proves that it's you, or that proves that it is it came from the entity that has an account, plus send send along these certificates that say these five entities make, make these claims about me, and then that's it. And then the reci the recipient of those pieces of information knows that your accounts, you actually do have those properties, at least if they trust the, the, the providers of the, that made those assertions and they know enough information that I quite often can at least to some extent trust you. So the important thing there is that, no, number one, it's a kind of organic sort of process where you don't need, even need to kind of all get together and kind of all stay dressed at the same time. It's an ecosystem that can kind of grow naturally. Start off with phone number verification, start off with is don't need any residency verification and go from there. Number two, don't need a centralized place to store all the data. It's sort of naturally much more distributed. No sort of central thing that, that someone can easily hack. And then finally, <laughs> you know, number three, much more efficiencies. Banks and potentially other entities can just sort of look at these assertions. The proofs need to only be made once. And once you make, once a particular you know, certificate exists, you can use it everywhere. In about a third of, of what Vitaly said isn't unique to the blockchain at all. You, you know, you take the example of EU residency. That's the Estonian government asserting that the name on your card matches the name on your passport, or the name on the certificate matches the name on your passport, or that your fingerprints are yours, or that uh, you haven't um, been found in any in in any criminal history data cases. And the Estonians themselves use this to tremendous effect. They all carry around, essentially, digital identity cards for which they can sign and encrypt documents <coughs> to, to, e to each other. And by some measures, this literally saves the government of Estonia about one to two percent of its gross domestic product, which is extraordinary. It basically means that in modern countries, we spend one week of every year dealing with paper and with signing contracts. Um, and so the point is not necessarily to get, the, get there all at once, but just to start making steps. I'd like to add one point to Judith's question, right? So I think that the, the misconception is generally that the KYC thing is a really big elephant that has to be top-down engineered. And you have to have banks coincide and then government regulators and agencies and then the people have to have buy-in. Now the beautiful thing is it could actually be a very spontaneous bottom-up process. Uh, I think that's what Vitalik was also saying, and I think that's what Estonia has some, somehow engineered. All you need is one identity smart contract where you have one check with your real world identity. So in the case of Estonia, you go to a consulate and they look at your passport and they see that you are effectively uh, who you claim you are. So you make a claim about who you are. I could perfectly claim in the smart contract that I'm Mickey Mouse, but when I go to the Estonian consulate, they will look at my passport and they see I'm not Mickey Mouse. So, Hopefully. I, my claim, <laughs> well, so my claim is being verified once and then I have that smart contract with my identity and, and that can start to be layered on by every service provider who needs to KYC me. So this, this whole absurdity of me opening a bank account uh, in, in, in Market Street and then having to take that same bundle of papers and copies of passports to you know, Marina Bay Financial Center to open another bank account could be out of the window without a massive white elephant type IT project at a national level. It could grow a lot more bottom up and I think there's a lot of hope that this will be solved soon. And it gets really interesting where you have states involved, right? Estonia needs to get this right. It has a much higher burden to make sure that he's not Mickey Mouse than your 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 <coughs> average company does. It has to maintain its obligations to NATO and the UN and the EU and the, and, and the OECD. So uh, it's one last also question, guys. Don't know. Sorry to cut you up. Is it the end of the secret services then? No more ah. F5. No more CIA. <laughs>
Where did that question even come from? <laughs> <laughs> I heard your mouse, you say it, so. What? Is there, is there a question in there? I don't, I'm not sure if we, we follow. You uh, talk about digital identity, right? No Mickey Mouse, you know who you are. So what about secret services? Well, the example we use is that, uh, <laughs> the example we, we use today is that without digital identity, it's like we're all driving along the information super highway without license plates. I think if you do put license plates on, on everyone and all the cars, um, you still need the cops. Uh, so there will likely, sadly, long be, be a role for law enforcement to stop uh, bad actors. Uh, um, but just like a state gives you, you know, your passport to navigate the real world, I think the argument here is that a state or some trusted entity like a state should give you your digital passport to navigate the digital world. I think it's worth clarifying that at least <laughs> I personally absolutely oppose national identity being mandatory to do anything on the internet. So these are tools. Yeah, we do too. <laughs> you know, these these are these are tools, and there are many applications. There are some applications where you want to remain anonymous, and there are many applications where, in order to increase trust, you want to be identified. And I think even one of the benefits of these kind of more sort of user-controlled approaches to the identity is that people even have a choice of how much they want to reveal in order in order to you know increase the kind of the level. If they want to reveal more to increase the level of trust that they get, they can if they want to. You know, I was just making uh, an argument to keep the Secret Service in, in, in business, right? Uh, so I think we run out of time for the prospect of how it's actually going to be a lot more question and discussion about decentralization. This is all about distributed the system, decentralized, uh, being democratic as well. I don't, I don't think we have time to discuss about all those, but those are really very important issues, but we really run out of time, so yeah, I'll pass it back to Cal, um, then. And Thank before you, we do that, if, if it's okay, yes. I just want to make one quick plug. The Estonians are actually going to be here in Singapore next week. There's a panel on Tuesday, and if you'd like, I'm sure we can figure out how to, how to, um, how to inform this group of that event. Thank you. Um, and with that, we, we conclude the formal presentations here. I think we could have gone on for an hour or, or more than that, but we're keeping you away from asking bilateral questions to our panel. So why don't we thank our entire panel for a very interesting session. I, uh, I want to particularly thank uh, David for, for uh, moderating this. Obviously, I want to thank Vitalik. I want to thank all of our uh, our panelists, speakers, but we do have tokens for everybody, but I also don't want to be the one holding you off from the food that we have outside and your chance to speak. So I just want to give two tokens away. I want to give one to Vitalik because obviously being the main speaker and a huge inspiration, I do want to give a token to him. So Vitalik, if I could just uh, hand this to you. And, and then I want to do something different. Um, Autonomous has been doing a lot of hard work and we don't always recognize when things go smoothest. But Rebecca, do you want to come up here? Uh, Rebecca, who worked for Autonomous and she's done a great job here. So. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, thank you to everybody. Also, we got, we got Aaron here from DBS, who's done a great job. So. Thank you to everybody for coming. I hope you learned. I learned a lot from this. I hope you do stick around for a little while longer outside. Speak to our panelists. Um, I'm also going to be around for a little while longer. Do eat some food. It's there for the same thing. And I hope to see you again for a future event. Thank you very much.